Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Hello and welcome to Louisiana Public Square. I'm Beth Courtney, President of Louisiana Public Broadcasting. And I'm Robert Travis Scott, President of the Public Affairs Research Council of Louisiana. In 2010, President Barack Obama signed into law his signature piece of legislation, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Last year, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the statute's controversial individual mandate, requiring all citizens to purchase health insurance or pay a penalty. To assist people in obtaining coverage, the act called for the creation of health insurance marketplaces nationwide by October of this year. Well, Louisiana Governor Bobby Jindal, like 35 other governors, chose to allow the federal government to operate the state's insurance exchange. Since the rollout last month of healthcare.gov, most of the media attention has focused on what visitors to the website cannot do. Well, tonight, Louisiana Public Square focuses on the things that applicants to the insurance exchange can do and answers questions including who is eligible to use it, what plans are available, how much do they cost, and what happens to those individuals still left uninsured. Join us over the next hour as we explore Louisiana's health care exchange. Michael Smith is a 19-year-old yes, resident right. of Calcasieu Parish so, who is currently right. uninsured. Yeah. My employer offers insurance, but it's a little too far out of my price range. It, you know, it'd be around three to four hundred dollars. Legally independent of his parents, Smith has been searching with a navigator for policies on the federal insurance marketplace. Enrollment began on October 1st and ends on March 31st, after which point individuals will be fined if they don't have insurance. Smith's income makes him eligible for subsidies from the government to help pay for his monthly premiums. My subsidy is about 223 and so going from a basic plan, uh, I pay nothing out of pocket, and even, you know, a good plan, I'd still only pay about 25, and then I could still get the number one highest plan that they've got, you know, the cream of the crop, the best one, pay about $130 out of pocket, which is fantastic. Smith is one of the nation's 2.7 million uninsured 18 to 35 year olds who are crucial to the success of the Affordable Care Act's insurance exchanges. That's your healthier population, so you need those people to participate because that's how insurance works. You're pooling risk and spreading it out over a, a, a larger base, and that's how insurance works. So if I've got a group of sick people over here, then I've got to have a group of healthy people here to make it balance out. Otherwise, the cost becomes spiked, and it's way out of balance. Doug Wilkinson is the field coordinator for the Louisiana Healthcare Education Coalition. He notes that the plans on the exchange are available for anyone who currently doesn't have some form of health coverage or purchases insurance without employer assistance. Government subsidies paid to your insurance provider are available depending on your income. The Kaiser Family Foundation estimates 344,000 Louisiana residents will be eligible for premium assistance through the exchange. The subsidies are for people that have 100 percent of the poverty level to 400 percent of the poverty level. So if the poverty level for a single person is $11,300, $11,700, then anybody that it's at that level up to around $45,000, $43,000 for a single person, they can get a subsidy. There are approximately 40 different qualified health plans available in Louisiana's exchange, offered by just four insurance providers. The average number of insurers competing for business in the 36 states that have exchanges run by the federal government is eight. The plans that we have in Louisiana on the exchange is Blue Cross Blue Shield every zip code. We have Humana, which is uh, only Jefferson Parish. We have Vantage, which is every parish except for Lafayette. And then we have uh, Louisiana Healthcare Connections, which is every parish. Plans offered on the marketplace are divided into four tiers of coverage, bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. 
bronze plans being the cheapest and platinum the most expensive. But the individual copay is highest under a bronze plan, 40 percent, and lowest under a platinum plan, 10 percent. According to the Department of Health and Human Services, Louisiana monthly premiums average $206 for a 27-year-old and just under $700 for a family of four under the bronze plan. And this is before any subsidies. The rates we've seen so far have been very competitive, um, probably less expensive than you would find in the Northeast and on the East Coast, also less expensive than you would find in the Pacific Northwest or in California. Michael Berto is the exchange coordinator for Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana. Besides competitive cost, Berto says the Louisiana plans offer many provider options. In a lot of states, the plans that you see listed on the exchange don't have a lot of doctors and hospitals associated with them, but our plans here have uh, very wide networks, very good coverage. Starting in 2014, Louisiana employers with 50 or fewer full-time equivalent employees will be able to purchase insurance on the exchange through the Small Business Health Options Program, or SHOP Marketplace. SHOP is for small business owners to be able to go in and buy a group policy in the marketplace. And, you know, it's actually a concept that small business owners have liked for a lot of years because it gives them buying powers. Renee Amar is the director of the Small Business Council for the Louisiana Association of Business and Industry. She says her members already have seen insurance rates rise due to new mandated benefits required under the Affordable Care Act. The state's larger employers, Amar says, could be the ones hurt by the insurance exchanges. The folks that would be concerned about the exchange are those that have 50 or more full-time equivalent employees because they can be hit with a fine if they've got an employee that opts into the exchange and uses a subsidy. That fine can be up to $3,000 per employee. Don Gregory is the state's former Medicaid director and current health care advisor for the Public Affairs Research Council. He says the individuals in Louisiana that are the most vulnerable in this entire process are those who don't qualify for either premium assistance or Medicaid, those in the federal poverty range of 11 to 100 percent. There will be a coverage gap of individuals uh, between what Medicaid currently covers and those that will be eligible for assistance through the exchange of about 214,000 individuals between the ages of 19 and 64. This gap is due to Governor Jindal's decision to opt out of the Medicaid expansion offered under the health care reform legislation. While this population, Gregory says, will receive health care services from the LSU hospital system and the new private partnerships built by the Jindal administration, federal funding to hospitals is being reduced under Obamacare. That phases in over a six-year period starting in 2015. Uh, the reduction will be for $18 billion, which equates to about 5% in 2015 and up to about 50% of that funding in 2019. The impact for Louisiana is the LSU hospital system and their new partners are highly dependent on this funding stream uh, to finance their operations. As Louisiana residents continue to maneuver through the delays on the healthcare.gov website that have only allowed 387 state enrollees so far, Wilkinson says not to panic, but take the time to choose wisely. This is a marathon, it's not a sprint. You know, there are glitches, sure, but this is a marathon, so take your time. We've got four months to go, so we've got plenty of time. There's statistic after statistic that shows that people with health care live longer. They're, they have better quality of lives and they live longer. That's what it's for, is to improve the quality of your life. So it's important that everybody get a policy. Joining us here in our studio are residents from the greater Baton Rouge area, including representatives from Southern University, LSU, the Junior League, and Leadership Louisiana. Well. Welcome everyone, and uh, we're hoping that you're ready to share your thoughts today. But first, let's look at our uh, citizen survey. LSU's Public Policy Research Lab surveyed over 120 citizens around the state on tonight's topic, and among the survey responses. When asked their thoughts on how difficult the 2010 health care law will make it for uninsured Louisiana residents to purchase health insurance, 59% of those surveyed said more difficult. 25% said less difficult, and 16% were unsure. In terms of costs, 
65% of respondents think that Louisiana residents overall will have to pay more for insurance due to the health care law. 13% said it won't make much of a difference, and 12% were unsure, and 9% said it will mean lower insurance coverage costs. When asked if the health care law will improve or limit their personal health insurance coverage, 45% of those surveyed said it will limit their coverage, and 35% said it won't have much effect. 13% said it will improve their insurance coverage, and 7% were unsure. And when asked their opinion on Governor Jindal's decision to rely on a federally facilitated insurance exchange rather than Louisiana setting up its own, 57% of respondents disagreed with his choice. 31% agreed with his decision and 12% were unsure. So let's start with that theme. I mean, has anyone here been on the exchange and tried to cope with the new system? And I believe we talked earlier, I think, Michael, you've, you've tried it, haven't sure, you? I've been online and, and couldn't get through. Been online and couldn't get through. Right. I mean, you couldn't even uh, couldn't even get the site up. I or? couldn't get past the first the first page. It, it jammed up. It said that it was timed out or waiting. Timed out or waiting. Okay. I've been on the site and uh, played around a little bit. And uh, what is it? Uh, and it's been. Um, it, it, maybe it's improved in the last couple of weeks since you used it. Right. So right. We have it's to been see. About I guess it's, it's under. It's a work in progress. Absolutely. I guess. <laughs> How about that? John, you you've, uh, are a businessman, and you've had some experience with this also, is that right? I've had several employees try to go on. I've encouraged them to explore their options since we currently provide benefits to our employees, but everyone's concerned about their rates. So I said, check out the site. And uh, several of them said, I can't get past it, which for them is especially frustrating because we're an IT company. And I when see. they see bad technology, it <laughs> drives them crazy. So. Well, maybe they could use a little of your <laughs> help up there in Washington getting that fixed up. So has anyone else tried uh, to get onto the exchange or know anybody who's tried to use it? Well, similar to these people I've had the uh, same issue here, tried to log on and time out. It's not working properly at, the, at that current time. How about that? Uh, well, you know, some of the situation we're facing here is, is that if you don't get insurance under the new regime, you may have to pay uh, a penalty. And I'm kind of especially interested in the younger people who are here and what decision they might think they would face. Would you rather, uh, if you feel like you're healthy and you don't really want insurance, would you rather pay the penalty or uh, would you rather uh, uh, go ahead and get the insurance? How about you, Michelle? <coughs> um, I don't really consider myself a risk taker, so I think I would go for the insurance, especially just because maybe if I did you know, become sick later on, I would you know, want that reliable um, you know, program to fall back on, not just rely on luck. <laughs> exactly. And Maria, have, have you given any thought to this uh, decision of waiting you? Um, well, currently I'm 25 and I have a few more months till I'm 26 of next year. Till I'm so you're uh, covered right now under your parents' policy? Yes. Is that right? Okay. All right. But I'm sure by the time I'm 26, I'll be prepared to go ahead and purchase a policy. If you, if you don't if get I it? If I don't have a coverage through my job. Through an employer, right, yeah. right, exactly. H how about you, Kalina? Uh, I would probably go with the insurance. Um, I actually don't have health insurance right now, and I think it would be awesome to have health insurance, so I'll be signing up soon. Yeah, well, have you taken a look yet at all the different varieties that you can choose from? I, mean, I, I have. Yeah? But what do you think uh, so far? I haven't uh, tried to log on because I've heard many horror stories, but uh, like, um, like it's been said, it's a marathon, not a sprint. I think I have time. I think you have time. That's right. Well, let's hope so. Let's hope they can get their act together uh, before very long. Uh, it, do any of you feel like uh, that you're about to start paying more under Obamacare? Of course, we, we, we already have insurance now, but now we have the new era with Obamacare with insurance. Matt, how about you? Well, I recently received a letter from my provider saying that my rates are going up 85% next year. Did they explain why or how that's happening? It just said due to the Affordable Care Act. Due to the Affordable Care Act. Well, right. did you have a, a policy that didn't have uh, very much coverage or? Uh, Not. I'd always liked it. You always <laughs> liked your policy. Okay, okay. But uh, it, did you look at what kind of policy you'd be moving into now to see whether uh, the what you're being paying for, more for, was actually going to give you uh, better coverage? Have you looked at that yet? No, I haven't. You haven't? Okay. I mean, I guess that would be the next stage. John? Uh, 
we just recently got our renewal information for at your at your company, right? And mm -hmm. and our average plan, uh, I feel better listening to to Matt. It wasn't eighty five percent, but uh, for example, one of the most popular plans went up twenty four percent. However, the deductible went from three thousand individuals, six thousand family, up to five thousand, ten thousand. So it's a forty percent increase in deductible for the pleasure of paying 24% more. I see. Now, and, and this is a situation where there are people employed and uh, presumably trying to get uh, insurance mm -hmm. through their employer. Betsy, you have a somewhat different situation with the folks that, that you work with. Tell us a little bit uh, about where you're coming from on this. Um, I am the director of an AmeriCorps program, and we have, we most of our members deal with the very poorest of Louisiana's citizens. And so I have two concerns. One is um, for those people who do fall through the gap of how, what kind of coverage they will be able to find if, without the Medicaid expansion. But um, even for those who are, you know, set up with a navigator, we're dealing with lots of people who've never looked at a computer before, may not even be able to read will really need high labor-intensive assistance in getting that kind of coverage. And that is something that, um, I mean, that's, that's where my concern comes in. And how, how to get them, how to get them enrolled and, and, how, to get and enrolled. how to communicate with them exactly what their d decisions are. There just has to be a huge amount of community education and um, really deep outreach. And there has been with the, the navigators. That's great. They probably need to be tenfold now, in their numbers. Daryl, you're a realtor, is that right? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, it, how how in your community of people uh, are you hearing this is going on? What kind of problems are people facing? Because well, most realtors have their own individual policy. Right. I, for instance, my Blue Cross rep came and said, "We need to look at your policy." And he said, "You're better off keeping your existing policy." And pay, he made it sound like I was going to have to pay a penalty not to be in the exchange system. I don't know if that's true or not. He wasn't sure what the penalty was when he came. It sounds like it may be $95 or 1% of your income. Well, we're, we're nearly two months in right. and still a lot of questions to be answered. And uh, how about uh, you, David? David, you're an attorney. Is that, that not right? That's right. Uh, tell me about uh, attorneys uh, and their practices and how they're handling this situation. Well, yeah, I'm a solo practitioner, so right. I'm not in with the law office. Most offices, I would expect, to have their own policies. Uh, I'm a little bit different from most in that I do not currently have a policy. And I've been kind of You waiting. don't have personal health insurance? I do not have I have okay. a certain situation. If I had insurance right now, I'd be paying an awful lot because I have a pre-existing condition uh, from I had a heart attack about five or so years ago. So does this mean that come January 1 uh, you will be able to get insurance? Uh, I don't know. You know I've been kind of sitting back waiting to see what's going to be happening with all the confusion of what's going on out there. I figured I would sit back and see what happened. I think they're going to be making some changes just like Kalina said you know, everything's just kind of up in the air, so and you don't have to do anything by the end of March, as I appreciate that's right. Let's it. say that situation, when our panel comes out, let's ask them, too, about your situation, whether or not you will be covered for the first time come January 1, if that's what you want to do, and that's what you think is a good idea. Okay. Well, G Governor Jindal decided that he didn't want to set up a state-run exchange for insurance, and a lot of states have done this, and a lot of them have it. They, they just decided to rely on the federal system and we've seen what a bust the federal system is. Do any of you have an opinion about whether or not you wish Governor Jindal had actually set up a state exchange or not? How about you Heather? I think it might have been beneficial. It seems to be the reports from other states that have set up their own exchange were successful. Um, you know would it have been the same here? You know that I couldn't tell. Um, I tend to question whether or not you know, the decision was best made for the citizens of Louisiana versus a political decision on the part of our governor. But I'm, I'm not privy to his decision um, or it's his a, reasons it, for his decision. It's a tough call. On the one hand, you could say it's a political move. But on the other hand, you could say there's a lot of information we don't seem to know. Right. And uh, we might have found the state exchange just in the same boat because they, they, they're not, no one's filled in the gaps on all this information. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this portion of the show. When we return, we'll be joined by a panel of experts to further explore the insurance exchange in Louisiana.
Welcome back to Louisiana Public Square. Tonight we're discussing the insurance exchange in Louisiana. Joining us now is our panel of experts. Brian Burton is the director of the Southwest Louisiana Area Health Education Center and the state director of Navigators for a Healthy Louisiana. Dr. Paul Perkowski is a vascular surgeon from Baton Rouge who serves on the Capital Area Medical Society's board of directors. He also chairs the Louisiana State Medical Society's Council on Member Services. Brian Keller is Senior Vice President and Chief Marketing mm -hmm. Officer at Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana. And Stephen Barnes is Director of the Division of Economic Development in the Department of Economics at LSU's E.J. Orso College of Business. Dr. Barnes' area of research interests includes health economics. I want each of you to tell me from your perspective what is the most important thing that our audience needs to understand about the exchange and how it's impacting you? And I want to start with you, our navigator, Mr. Burton. I think the most important thing to understand is that there are people and there are resources out in the community that can provide you with um, excellent information that is unbiased and that is out there to give you all of the things that you need to know to make the decision that is the most important for you and your family. I think the most important thing I would like our panel and our, our patients to know that physicians want patients. We want you to come see us. We This is our vocation. We have uh, some uncertainties uh, in the marketplace now but I'm here to try to clear up the air as to whether a physician can opt out of the process and uh, how we can contribute to their health plan. Well, Mr. Keller uh, with Blue Cross, you are right in the middle of all this. Yep. You probably have plenty to tell us, but just what's the most important thing on your mind tonight? I think the most important thing for everybody here is everything has changed. I mean, if you bought insurance before, if you couldn't buy insurance before, it is all changing and there's a lot of misinformation out. So you need to go to trusted advisors, whether they're a navigator in a new relationship or your current insurance agent or Blue Cross and find out what your options are because you can potentially save money, get a better policy. Could cost you more, but if you don't go ask and find out, you're operating in the unknown. Uh, how about you, Mr. Barnes? As an economist at LSU, how do you see this? Well, I think it's important to think about kind of from the big picture how we set out to do reform. You know, so we didn't get rid of the old system and bring in a national health care system or a single payer system. What we did was take the existing pieces that we had that didn't fit together that well and try to find ways of changing them a little bit, modifying so they fit together well and, and cover more people along the way. So I think the exchanges is a piece that's changed more than many others. You know, so there's going to be some learning along the way, but but, but, you know, there will be a lot of familiar pieces that people can recognize and kind of learn from uh, as they get acquainted with the new system. And I get a sense from our audience that there are some people who may have a, a little more struggle learning some of this uh, than others. Kayla, you had a question along those lines for our panel. I think that a lot of this is being pushed out on the Internet, and I have a little bit of an issue with allowing people to only get their information from the Internet or sign up for some of these services on the Internet when we're talking about a population that maybe can't read don't have access to the internet outside of maybe a library or maybe, I mean, don't even know how to turn a computer on. I mean, there's several different things that that a lot of, even the baby boomers, maybe don't quite know how mm -hmm. to do. So specifically, when you are giving outreach within the community, what does that look like? And how do you reach out to those individuals that have those questions regarding how do I start or who do I go to? And how much more time does paperwork take mm -hmm. if you do it Absolutely. in that method? Um, why don't you go ahead? Uh, the federal government has a certification training for insurance agents if they want to sell the federally qualified plan. So oh, in this state, about 800 agents that I'm aware of have already been certified, qualified, passed their test, and learned this. Um, because it is complex, if you know an insurance agent who sells health, ask them, you know, are you certified for the health care reform, for the uh, PPACA, for all, all the new policies being sold? Most of them that sell health are now. 
they can walk you through it so you don't have to spend time on a computer because it's complex. It's not as easy as shopping for a hotel room or a flight. It's a lot <laughs> well, more complex than that. Sometimes that's complicated. <laughs> you know, I mean, for us, when we look at the 800,000 underinsured and underinsured in the state of Louisiana, we know that they cross the gambit of all different types of populations. So when we're talking about the young people that are entering the marketplace for the first time, you know, they're very tech savvy. So we need to be able to use the internet and social media as a tool to be able to provide that. But at the same time, we know that there are a lot of people in a lot of communities across Louisiana that do not have access to internet service, do not have access to internets. So we need to make sure that the per information that we provide is culturally competent, that we're meeting them where they are that we're, we're reaching out to faith-based organizations, to community-based organizations. We're reaching out to elected officials and communities that can hold town hall meetings. We look for every gathering of people, whether it's at state fairs or public, um, public events or things like that, that we'll be able to provide that kind of information. And we're able to adjust the information based on what the literacy levels of the people we're working with are. Yeah, and uh, some of the good news is, now David, it seems to me you might be able to get some insurance after January 1st. We were talking about that earlier. Why don't you tell the panel about your situation and maybe they can address it. Well, I don't currently have insurance. You know, I'm not a young person, but I am older and uh, I have not had insurance in the past because it was too expensive. I have a uh, previous heart attack which would have made insurance, you know, out of the question for me to, to get. And I think we were talking about whether or not I would be covered after January 1st or if I need, need to call somebody to get covered or does it just kick in or what happens? Well, if it happens, something happens during the show, Dr. Perkowski is here. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> as, as far as after January 1st is concerned, what is going to happen? Is David now in a, in, a, in a new world in which he's going to be able to get insurance, Mr. Keller? He absolutely is. If you... Uh, Call an insurance agent, walk into a Blue Cross office, call the navigators. Sign up before December 15th. There are no medical questions asked, and you can buy a policy. And there will be a wide range of prices to choose from at different levels of coverage. So the law in a lot of ways was designed for people just like you. You know, under the Affordable Health Care Act, the, one of the things, one of the um, things that were put into the Care Act where's the 10 essential benefits. And one of those essential benefits, besides laboratory service, prescription drugs, ambulatory service, is pre-existing conditions. And so the beauty about the Affordable Health Care Act versus the way the insurance was written in the past is there is no more underwriting. So the only really question that you're going to be put into a category with people your age versus what your health condition is. The only thing that they're going to ask you concerning health condition is whether or not you're a tobacco user in order to be able to create, you know, to add that tobacco surcharge to your, um, to your income, to your, um, your premium. premium. Thank That's you. That's right, right. And, and as an economist, uh, Dr. Barnes, how are you seeing uh, the impact on the population in general for these types of dynamics, the way it's, it's, it's changing? Uh, well, I think this is a great example of one of the key provisions that was intended to expand coverage, you know, by getting rid of the pre-existing conditions and, and rating based on health, uh, you know, that, that's going to provide an opportunity for you that may not have existed previously. Um, I, I would also kind of highlight that this is an example of kind of maybe de demystifying this exchange to some extent, mm -hmm. you know, so even last year, you know, you could have gone out into the private market and looked for a policy something you weren't thinking about doing because you, you knew or you had a, 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 an experience years before that suggested this was very expensive and n not something you were really interested in pursuing. And I think there's now a new sort of analogy to take that place, which is the exchange. You can ac access that hopefully through the web or through one of these other channels we've talked about, you know, but, but that now there's still a similar place you can go to that hopefully has uh, you know, better access for you and better premiums to go with it. I'd like to bring in, in Dr. Perkowski into the discussion a, a little bit because uh, as, as working as a doctor, there's obviously there's been a world with insurance and now we have a new world with insurance and how uh, is that changing for your profession? What, what's the intersection there with what you're doing in the new insurance world? Well, first I'd like to say we've seen both sides of uh, the new Affordable Care Act. We've seen a patient who previously may not be able to afford insurance who would be able to get it, but we've also seen a person whose policy may now cost him 50, 60, 70 percent more than it did last year. So that's an important 
uh, distinction that we don't want to lose sight of. But as a physician, I would, I would say at a most basic level, we're going to care for those patients no matter their ability to pay. Uh, it's a vocation for us. If you show up at our door, we're going to do everything we can to care for you. Uh, in Louisiana, with a very extensive poor and un uninsured and underinsured population, that's been very difficult for us at times. Mostly because not only am I a physician, but I'm a small business owner. I work for myself, I have employees, I have a, a building that I have to pay rent and upkeep for. So the reason, on a basic level, that we charge to care for you is so our employees and us ourselves can make a living. So we hope that that, that whole interaction becomes more fruitful for everyone and more smooth are than it getting, has in the past. Are you getting the information that you need to, to help do your work on your end to facilitate this new insurance world? Well, there's been a lot of misinformation for the population, and that same misinformation makes it back to the physician. For instance, um, there may be surveys or physicians who put signs on their windows that say, we will not accept Obamacare. Um, that's a fallacy. Um, if you sign up for an insurance plan on the exchange through one of the four plans in Louisiana, uh, for instance, Blue Cross Blue Shield, if I'm a provider of Blue Cross Blue Shield, I am now in your network. It is not an Obamacare policy, it's a Blue Cross policy. Therefore, you are covered by any physician who takes Blue Cross Blue Shield. There's no distinction of Obamacare or not Obamacare. Okay. So a physician yeah. does not understand that mm -hmm. uh, because of that misinformation. Right. That's a good clarification. I appreciate it. And Matt, you, you highlighted a situation that I think may be affecting a lot of people. Uh, tell the panel uh, earlier about what happened when you started looking for insurance. Uh, mm -hmm. I got a letter from Blue Cross about three or four months ago saying that if you change the effective date of your policy to the end of the year, we can put off your 85% premium increase until the end of next year. I see. In other words, it was your existing policy and you right. had quite a shock. Okay. Right. Okay. And uh, so, what are you going to do? I am going to hide and watch. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Panelists, who wants to take a shot? I signed that letter. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> good to see you, Matt. Um, yeah, the the new law does put more coverages, more mandates, and it changes how you rate. Uh, some younger people get rated more. Some who are older actually get a slight decrease. So it changes the entire rating system and what's covered. So we did. We sent out letters like most of the insurance carriers in the state and said, this is what the new policies will look like by law. If you do nothing, this is what your rates would look like. Now, the letter didn't go out to everybody. We sent it to those who were going to be most impacted and said, We've always given people a chance to change your anniversary date, and if you do that to 12-1, it will buy you 11 months at the lower rate. There were others who may get a 10 or 15 percent rate decrease. I didn't mail them a letter and say, do you want to move and keep paying more? So it kind of varies by person. So you made a good decision. <laughs> John? Dr. Rukowski, uh one of the promises that was made by President Obama was not just if you like your plan, you can keep it, but if you like your doctor, you can keep it. And uh, one of the things that I've been concerned about is that you hear stories of how some of the providers are cutting back the, the number of physicians that are now part of their, their plan. So from a, a patient perspective, I'm concerned, will I have my doctor, but I'm sure that there's also concern with physicians. Hey, am, am I going to get cut from United Healthcare or Blue Cross Blue Shield? This is. Are you feeling that pressure also in Louisiana? Um, in a way, yes, but mostly no. Uh, I think Louisiana is in a little different situation. There's only four plans, four different companies offering plans, and one uh, company has the lion's share of the policies in the state. And the vast majority of the physicians in the state are are in in that network, and you know he's sitting he's sitting next to it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we feel a little bit comfort in that, meaning that if you if anyone here goes on the exchange who is my patient, 
and they lose their policy or need to change their policy to get in an affordable range, then chances are they're gonna, I'm still gonna be in that network. So that's comforting. Now, if you look nationwide, that may not be the case. Some states, and there are certain uh, insurance companies that may be trying to narrow down their plans because they don't like the uncertainty or they don't like actual actuarial costs or other mathematical abstracts that I don't, I don't <laughs> know about. And those doctors or plans or networks may lose <coughs> a lot of patients. But Louisiana has a, little, has a little advantage. Mr. Burton, you want to add in? A yeah, I, well, I'd like to say that, like you said, in Louisiana, there are four major insurance providers. We all know about Blue Cross Blue Shield. There's Vantage, which is out of Monroe, which is in every parish in Louisiana but Lafayette. There's also Humana, which is only in Jefferson Parish. But there's also a new, a new player in town, and that's called Louisiana Health Cooperative. And Louisiana Health Cooperative is a co-op that was actually carved out of the Affordable Health Care Act. And the, pur the purpose for the creating this new healthcare cooperative, and a cooperative meaning a nonprofit, meaning that you put people put money in, people take money out, and you make sure that it's balanced. You always want to make sure that there are more um, well people in the program than there are sick people using the program, but it creates competition. And I use the analogy all the time of a gas station. If you've got one gas station all by itself, the prices are going to be astronomical. But if you get four gas stations on a corner, then you're going to have a, you're going to create a marketplace competition. So one's going to drop it down, the other's going to drop it down. And so that's what we're seeing in Louisiana is by, um, by creating more and more insurance companies, you're going to create more competition. I'm getting a little concerned here about the notion that not enough people are going to sign up and this, this whole system <laughs> might collapse. I want to talk to our uh, economist, Dr. Barnes, about that. Do we know the economics of what would happen if not enough people sign up for this? Absolutely. Um, and, and in fact, the individual mandate was put in place specifically to try to make sure that people sign up. Um, and in fact, uh, the way the private marketplace has worked in the past has been hampered by the fact that people who are expecting to buy more health care services and, and use that insurance very heavily are much more likely to sign up. Those who think of themselves as healthier are more willing to take that risk. And so uh, as, as we move forward, if we have only uh, those that are going to use the services more heavily sign up uh, and we don't get everybody to come along to share those risks, then what we're going to see is a big increase in premiums next year. And when we reassess those decisions next year, uh, even among those who signed up this year, you're going to have some people look at those higher premiums and say, well, maybe it's not worth it anymore. And, and the whole system kind of comes unraveled. I see. So, so to make this viable, you've got to have a nice mix of folks, uh, healthy folks, and, and those who need more medical care uh, to share those costs and keep premiums down. And, and maybe or maybe not the, the penalties will help push that along. I mean, I guess that's one of the other questions I'd have for an economist. Is it, will the penalties be effective, do you think, to, to try to make people sign up? Well, uh, you know, time will tell exactly how well that works out. Um, I think uh, it's, it's going to be really interesting to see how people at different income levels respond to those things. So uh, we know that, um, you know, penalties are related to the level of income that a person has or a family has, uh, but people also have uh, access to subsidies uh, for the premiums that they mm -hmm. would pay based on their income. Mm -hmm. And so it's all going to come down to that decision about, you know, how much is that subsidy versus that penalty. And you're going to find a, a group of folks who uh, can get insurance at a cost that, uh, after taking into consideration that subsidy, um, it's more money in their pocket uh, because they avoid that penalty. So there will definitely be some that sign up. Yeah, tell thank you. at any point uh, where we have the greatest ability to influence people who may be on the line who may say you know what I may opt for the penalty versus signing up you know is that is there a point where maybe the discussion with the navigator helps tilt at, tilt that and if it is the navigator group is there a way that you kind of collect that intel and are able to kind of speak to trends about the ability to influence someone to make the decision to participate in the plan versus just saying, hey, I'm going to go ahead and take the penalty. Mr. Burton, that one's for you. Yes. I mean, the <laughs> first thing we do when we sit down with you is we want to get some information about your family. We want to know what your resources are, how many people are on your family, so that we can see whether or not you qualify for premium tax credits. And then let's look at that. But a lot of times people want to talk to us about, well, I, I'm not, I don't want to do anything. I just want to, I think I'm just going to go ahead and um, 
and pay the penalty, the, the mandate penalty. And that's okay. I mean, our job is not to try and convince you one way or the other. It's just to make sure that before you make that in informed decision, that you're actually informed about all of the things. So let's look at the plans. Let's look at what is available for you. Look at what the subsidies are. And then you make the decision that whatever you want to do. But what you'll see is that many people will realize instead of paying a penalty and giving that money to the federal government and getting nothing for it, maybe what I can do is I can buy maybe just a bronze level plan for my family or something like that and at least have something for it instead of just giving the money away. So we want to make sure that we educate you first and then let you as the individual make the best decision that you feel is the best for you. Okay. And I do have one follow-up question, I'm sorry. So okay. do you feel just in some of the work that you've done with folks that people, consumers really understand that a part of that penalty is a part of the IRS system and so, you know, the way IRS pursues penalties from a tax standpoint could be the way it's pursued from a healthcare standpoint. So do you find that there is an opportunity to leverage that insight or perspective to individuals? That, I mean, that's exactly that's what we spend most of our time doing is uneducating people from all of the information <laughs> that they're getting from all of the other sources other than LPB. But, um, <laughs> so no, I do, no, but I mean, there's so many misnomers. Everything from, a lot of people think that Obamacare is like Medicare or Medicaid, it's just another government program and it's not it's it's your same insurance providers that have always been around okay um, a lot of people think that um, I mean there's just so much unknowing so if we can really work with them and explain to them what the facts are and that they could understand that you know we as navigators have no dog in this hunt our job mm -hmm. is to make sure that you are educated and that you can make the best decision for you. So we provide you with unbiased information so that you know what's out there and that you make the decision that you want to make for you and your family. Let me get a clarification and then we're going to go to Timothy, but let's talk about the subsidies and the, and the penalties. I mean, what exactly happens with these subsidies? Am I going to get a check uh, that's going to come in my mail? And uh, these penalties, exactly uh, how are they going to be ramped up? How about Let you, me Ms. clear Keller? up one thing on yeah. the, the taxes. That's Everybody's saying $95. It's $95 or 1% of your income, whichever is higher. So if you're making $20,000 a year, it's $200. It's not $95. That's your penalty if you don't sign up. Correct. Okay. And it ramps up every year. Mm -hmm. Next, the following year, it's $295 or 2%. That's correct. Right. Mm -hmm. And then $695 Six, or 3%. Is that, that right? 2.5%. 2.5. 2. 2. 2. 5. 5. 2. 5. So it ramps up each year. Mm -hmm. No. No? That's, that, okay. that's uh, 2014, 2015, 2016. Mm -hmm. So each year the taxes or penalties get higher and they are a tax. They'll mm -hmm. be hit on, as a great point you made, it'll be on your 2015. When you do your taxes for 2014 is where that penalty or tax will be assessed. And then the subsidy is just an advanced tax credit. So you're guessing at your 2014 income, that subsidy will come straight to the insurance carrier you pick. And then you're going to be wrong because you're guessing how much you're going to make in 2014. And that will also get adjusted on your 2015 tax form. So when you do your 2014 taxes in April of 2015. It sounds like tax is going to be more fun than ever before. More than ever before. That's right. right. Let's let Timothy jump in. Well, right. my question is, I guess it since all of the unknown that is out there for is uh, what the uh, Affordable Care Act is about, uh, would you, as a panelist, would you say it would be best uh, due to the fact that Congress should push back the individual mandate for at least one year. And what, do, what is your view on that? I think, um, you know, the way that this reform was designed is a delicate balance trying to get a lot of the, uh, you know, competing forces to kind of balance out and work together. And so, as we touched on earlier, that individual mandate is, an, is a critical part of trying to get the exchanges up and running and make that a viable market. Um, so I think, you know, maybe we need to buy a little more time, but we've got to think about moving these pieces together. You know, we can't take them one at a time and, and, and move them around without considering their, the other consequences that might have. Still so many questions. John, then we'll go to Kayla. Sure. A follow-up to, to Timothy's question. Uh, Senator Landrieu uh, recently proposed the uh, Keep the Affordable Care Act Promise Act or the CACA mm -hmm. Promise Act. Um, so my question with that is, how do you turn the ship around when they've been heading this direction for three years? Is it even possible to turn around in a few weeks? Well, there's, I'll take it just yeah, sure. again. Go ahead, Dr. There's, Brown, there's several layers to that question. The first layer is, can it be turned around within a matter of weeks? Can, does your insurance commissioner of your, of your particular state 
agree that it can be turned around. Uh, statutorily, can the president make unilaterally make that decision? Uh, can this, 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 this is it allowable in that state to make that decision? And then, what are the consequences? <coughs> of the we, we just heard from Dr. Barnes the consequences of pushing back the individual mandate. If you push, if you turn around these plans that were deemed not um, not in not in line with the new law, and you start selling them again, what what will happen to the system? So there's there's several layers to that question. That okay, we're we're, we're going to go to Kayla in the, in the meantime, Dr. Perkowski, if you could give uh, Mr. Burton a prescription for that cough. <laughs> <laughs> Kayla, um, I wanted to ask Dr. Barnes what you saw as some other unintended consequences within the um, economic outlook due to the Affordable Care Act that we might not be thinking about? Um, well, one of the things that uh, economists spend a lot of time looking at is how public policies affect individual decisions. Um, I think something that wasn't contemplated in the original design of the Affordable Care Act is the, what we've seen with a fair number of states deciding not to expand Medicaid coverage. And so uh, what that means is that individuals are going to be looking at their circumstances and their situation and trying to figure out, you know, what are my options? And so uh, an interesting, perhaps, uh, uh, consequence of not having that Medicaid expansion here is that you're going to find a group of folks who historically have not had insurance um, uh, now might have an opportunity to gain m much better access to coverage and, and some significant subsidies if they can actually increase their income a little bit. So there's actually a chance in some of those states that there could be a, a very, maybe a small silver lining there, but you know, that I think is an interesting unintended consequence of how this has rolled out as we've now seen it. And maybe Mr. Burton, you could help explain this, or you, Mr. Keller. Um, I mean, there, there, if we had a Medicaid expansion in Louisiana, which we did not accept, uh, there would be a lot of people on the low income uh, level who would then be available for that federal type of coverage, not through the commercial uh, companies. And so uh, are you running into a situation where uh, people are coming to you and saying, okay, I'm ready for my insurance now, and uh-oh, wait a minute, you would be eligible for Medicaid, but we're not taking that, so you're not getting any options. You're not getting an exchange option or, or anything. Is that happening? Yes, that is correct. I mean, it, that would not in Louisiana, us not expanding Medicaid has left a huge portion of people, of, of our population, out of the picture, so it, it's you know it's unfortunate, but that is just the hand that was you know given to us. So all we can really do is explain to them that there's nothing more that we can do, but you know, Mr. Kelly. Yeah, the um, to his point, it it's the people making below a hundred percent of the federal poverty level uh, and above eleven percent. So it's just that window of people who are ineligible for Medicaid and ineligible for a subsidy or tax credit. So it is a gap in this state and many others. It's the working poor in Louisiana. Right. And so you have a lot of people on the, on the very low income level who are not mm -hmm. going to have to deal with this exchange because they're not really eligible for it because of their income level. You have a lot of people who uh, get insurance now through their employer and they can pretty much sustain what they're doing mm -hmm. already, right? I mean, what we, it's all these folks in the middle, but this is a huge middle, right? right. Right. Do we have any idea of the order of magnitude of people we're talking about in Louisiana who are going to have to cope with the exchange? We've got um, about, about 400,000 mm -hmm. who should be eligible to purchase, Correct. get a subsidy. You've got about 2.2 million now that have insurance. Mm -hmm. Most of that is through companies, uh, and most of those same people will have insurance through their companies or whatever other job they switch to. I think the numbers of those that kind of fall in that gap. About 145, I think, yeah. about 145,000. Yeah, I've, so I've heard about 200. Different numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so Betsy? Um, going back to that, that small group, but that would not get the Medicaid expansion and can't go on the exchange, even though it's a small group, it's probably a medically needy group mm -hmm. and one that will use lots of medical resources. And there would be a huge economic impact because they're going to be cared for and someone's going to pay for it. Everyone's going to pay for it. They're not going to pay for it, but the rest of the state will pay for it. And they're being cared for now. Well, let's, well, they will be cared <laughs> for. Well, now. let's just think of the complexities of this situation that existed in Louisiana even before the Affordable Care Act and the additional layers that are added because of the changes that are coming down. And then it goes back to the question about unintended consequences. Because as a physician, if you think, 
I have somewhere between four, 200 and 400 pa uh, patients who will now have some form of insurance, then you have to think of who's going to take care of them. Mm -hmm. There's the same number of physicians in Louisiana as there were before, and a lot of those patients without insurance weren't seeing the doctor. So there's that layer. Then you have this, uh, this group that are uncovered before and still will become uncovered because of the lack of Medicaid expansion. Where do those patients go? In the past, they went to what we referred to as a charity hospital. And those, many of those are closing because of the private-public partnerships that um, go along with closing of the state hospital system. So that's another layer. Uh, and then there's the existing Medicaid population as it exists now that have access problems to begin with. You may not have a, a primary physician that accepts Medicaid, new Medicaid patients. You may have a subs the nearest subspecialist in vascular care, for instance, that takes Medicaid may be two towns or three towns over. Mm -hmm. Or you may have to go to the, the borders of the state, New Orleans or, or Shreveport, to see a certain subspecialist. So that layer existed now and it may be exacerbated. So Dr. Perkowski, if I want to make sure I understand one of the points you're trying to make. If more and more people get insurance, that puts more and more pressure on doctors across the state to perform those services. Are you saying that doctor by doctor they're concerned about uh, more people getting insurance or are you just talking about sort of the broad issue across the state of there being more pressure for more doctors? Well we hope that more patients with insurance equals more access. We hope that. But at the same time, if you have more access but you don't have more capacity, then that's, that's a burden. And what's that's the solution to that? More, more physicians. physicians. Yes, but I mean, what's the solution to that? <laughs> more, more medical schools, more payment systems that pay for re graduate medical education. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, we could you, we could have a whole nother public you know, school. <laughs> on that. That's right. Michelle, we're, we're about to wrap up, but we've got time for one more question. Oh, sure. Um, so I have a question about that government um, maybe oversight and increased volume of patients um, with doctors. So do you think that this will impact the quality of care that each patient gets? And um, will these also affect health care education in Louisiana as far as will there be a standardization of what medical students learn? Well, I'll take your first question and say the, the quality of care should go up. If a patient has a heart attack and doesn't have insurance, he's less likely to see a physician. If he has a heart attack and does have insurance, he's more likely to see a physician. So his quality of care or her quality of care should go up. If uh, Taking out the, the access problem, if a physician sees 20 patients a day and now there's twice as many insured then he does he have to see 40 a day? Well, that's a that's kind of a long-term problem, which is a good in a way that's a good problem to have because the the patient is now seeking care for something that he wasn't seeking care for before, and and to add another sub answer to that, many patients who don't have insurance will seek care in an emergency room, and that's a triage situation, stabilize and and go see your primary physician. Well, guess what? They don't have a primary physician. So your second question about standardization. The graduate medical education system is already highly standardized. The issue is the quality of education. So if I was a resident at LSU and I was in a big charity a hospital that had five, six, seven hundred beds and I had ten or fifteen or twenty patients that I could care for, that's a very robust education. Now if I'm an LSU resident and there's only four or five or six patients in that hospital, then I don't get that robust education. Yeah. Well, Michelle, you're on your way to medical school, is that right? Yes. Well, we hope you have good luck learning medicine, but we also hope you have good luck learning about insurance. I think you're going to need to add another year onto your education. To know. I, I want to run down the line real quick, each of you just one quick thing that you want to leave the audience with, one last thought that you want to leave the audience with, and we'll come right down the line starting with you, Mr. Perkins. I think that it's important to know that there are resources in your community, and you need to be able to access those resources. One of the, the quickest ways to do that is contact your elected official. Ask them if you don't have any other resource to be able to do that. We've got um, websites, LouisianaHealthCareNav.com. We'll let people know throughout the state where we are, what we're doing, how you can access those navigators in your community. And look at that Louisiana Public Square website, and you'll get those links for those other websites. Dr. Perkowski. Well, if I had to think of a buzzword about the physician side of this, it would have to be access. The 
medical society in general and me as a physician is all about access to care, quality care, and an affordable price. And hopefully, if you take out your telescope and look into the deep future, this process will help that along. Mr. Keller, the last word from Blue Cross. It's about options, it's about change. Um, you have new options where you can maybe buy new couldn't before. You may have options to save some money and get an advanced tax credit or subsidy, and the policies are changing. So you have to find somebody, whether it's an insurance agent you know, call a navigator, come visit Blue Cross, find out the real facts for yourself, and see what your options are. You have a lot of those. And Dr. Barnes will let the economist put the punctuation on it. Well, I would say uh, to, to look at options today and try to find similarities to things you're already familiar with, because uh, a lot of the pieces of this new design are really you know, modifications and hopefully some improvements on things that have been around for many years. Well, we've run out of time for our question and answer segment. We'd like to thank our panelists, uh, Mr. Burton, Dr. Perkowski, Mr. Keller, and Dr. Barnes for their insight on this month's topic, when we come back, we'll have a few closing comments. A good conversation, a smart audience, great yes. questions, and we'll be talking about this topic for a long time. A very important one, for sure. Absolutely. Well, that's all the time we have for this edition of Louisiana Public Square. We encourage you to visit our website at lpb.org slash public square. While you're there, take this month's survey, view extended interview clips, and comment on tonight's show. We would love to hear from you as we did from viewers following last month's program, Pot or Not, the decriminalization debate. Well, Chris wrote to us, the big problem with pot is it is a window drug to other ones. Robert writes, marijuana is only a gateway to drug dealers that have other drugs. And a North Bossier resident wrote to us, by legalization and taxation of marijuana, we not only free up quite a significant amount of dedicated expenditures, we will also tap a new source of revenue, which the state desperately needs. Well, certainly, thank, thank you for your comments. We appreciate your feedback, whatever. Occupations in the fields of science, technology, and engineering and math are projected to grow by nearly 10% over the next five years. Well, who will fill these positions? Currently in Louisiana, there are nearly three STEM job openings for every unemployed worker. We'll join Louisiana Public Square next month as it looks for answers on an encore broadcast of STEM status, science, technology, engineering, and math in Louisiana. Well, thanks for watching and good night. Good night, everyone. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org. Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. 